Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're part of our beautiful Reading With Your Kids family. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app and also on Podchaser. That's a new one we just became aware of. We have a wonderful guest for you today. Her name is Melissa Sarno, and she is going to be telling us about her middle grade novel, A Swirl of Ocean. Before Melissa joins us, we want to let you know where you can get caught up in a swirl of family fun. That's right. You can come on down and join Jedley's Totally Interactive Magic Circus in New Bedford, Massachusetts at the New Bedford Public Library. G- December, we're talking about jobs, I was going to say January, December 31st, New Year's Eve, the beautiful city of New Bedford, Massachusetts. I've been celebrating New Year's Eve in New Bedford since the beginning of the 2000s. Um, the, I, I have a poster in my office from 2004. I actually think I started in 2002, 2003. So for at least 15, 16, maybe 17 or 18 years, I've had the pleasure of celebrating the New Year, ringing in the New Year in the beautiful city of New Bedford, Massachusetts. And the wonderful thing that's about it, I've, I've literally seen families grow up. There's this is one great guy that I've seen, I think, every single year. He's such a great guy. He's now an, an adult, but he still comes down to every show, and I, I love seeing him, and it, it's such a pleasure. And there's so many other activities. It's all free. You can find out more by going to newbedfordguide.com. Join us New Year's Eve, City of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Join us right now from the Westchester area of the state of New York. She is the author of a fantastic new middle grade book called A Swirl of Ocean. Please welcome to the show, Melissa Sarno. Melissa, how are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm really happy that you're on the show, and I'm really excited for you to tell us all about A Swirl of Ocean. Yeah, I can give you a little little blurb about what it's about. Um, So it's called A Swirl of Ocean. It is about a girl named Summer who is 12 years old. Um, And when she was two years old, she was found on the shore of the ocean on Long Island, and um, no one knew who she was or where she came from. And an investigation was done and no one ever could figure it out. And she was adopted by the woman who found her. Her name is Lindy. Um, and they sort of have lived, lived their lives together um, in this beach house on the ocean. And now, 10 years later, Lindy is dating someone new. And he's talking about moving in and their family is changing a bit. And so Summer starts to sort of question whether or not she really belongs in this family and where she might have come from. And one night she's out swimming and um, she nearly drowns in this riptide. And she swallows all of this ocean water. And that night she begins having some very strange dreams about a girl named Tink. And she suspects that this girl is connected to her and her past. And slowly, as you read the book, the mystery unfolds of how she and this girl are connected to one another. That's a a, a fascinating story. And it's both, uh, you know, terrifying being caught up in a riptide. um, And also, I think it's terrifying in that place where Lindy, uh, where, where Summer finds herself at 12 years old, not knowing if she belongs. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that as a writer, I'm always grappling with because it's something I grappled with at that age and probably something that I still think of. Um, this like finding a place to belong, people that you belong with. Um, I like writing about it, I guess. I think that's a feeling that a lot of kids at, at that age grapple with. And, and am I wrong in thinking that is something that that's, a, you know, especially something that, that girls kind of grapple with? Um, 
I think so. I, you know, I don't want to make any, you know, gender stereotypes. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that all kids of all genders, you know, feel that way, mm-hmm. um, yeah. where they're looking for a place to belong. But I specifically did feel that a girl's sort of search for that at that age, um, it might be more poignant or pronounced. I'm not really sure, but I really did want to explore, um, specifically girls at that age at 12, um, with so much in their lives changing, changing friendships and things like that. Um, I think they do are, they are searching maybe in a deeper way for, you know, who, who their true friends are, who, um, you know, how they fit in their family, how they fit in their social circles. Um, you know, I am a girl, so I can really (laughs) speak to, can only speak to that. Um, I'm sure that a lot of kids, um, you know, sort of look for that, but I did want to explore the idea of a girl searching for that at that time in her life. What was it about this age group that is attractive for you to, to write about and to write for? Um, that's a great question. Um, the reason I write about that age is because I think it's just so, it's a time of life that's just so ripe with tension and, and sort of intrigue. I don't know. I always think back to when I was that age, a lot of the stuff that I was sort of grappling with. And I remember like being on the playground when I was in like fifth grade, I think it was. And I was just sort of swinging on the swings with my friends and, you know, it was recess um, at school. And then this girl came over to me. Her name was also Melissa, but she was very much the popular Melissa in my class. And she came up to me and said, "Um, all the fifth graders are meeting over by the blacktop to talk. And I thought, okay, Um, I get off the swing. I go over to the blacktop and everyone starts sitting in this circle. And Melissa says, we're all going to talk about who we like, like, Uh. and (laughs) we sort of sit around the circle and I don't even know who I like. Like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of somebody because everyone's going around. And so I sort of pick this kid who I think, okay, he's kind of cute. All right. I'll pick him. And I sit and I say his name, his name is David. And then we get to David and he says, Melissa. And I thought it was me, but it wasn't. It was the other Melissa. And so all of a sudden, there I am just swinging on my swing, you know, that I do every day at recess. And all of a sudden, I'm caught up in this, who likes who? I don't even, I didn't even think I liked this guy. Now I'm upset that he doesn't like me. All in that moment. And I just really remember that moment. I always think about it. And I think that's why I'm drawn to writing for this age group. Because it's like a time when you're still a kid, but... Things are changing, and I always think about that time as being sort of a turning point um, a lot. But I also love to write for the age group because I think that middle school and middle grade, like fifth and fifth grade and up, um, I think they're just a very a group of kids who are really curious and open. And I love writing for that for the age. And I've now met kids who have read my books and who are reading, and I. I love their curiosity and their openness um, and their intelligence too. So, yeah. yeah, it is. It is a fascinating age. I, I have to ask, cause I know people out there are thinking, uh, did you go on Facebook and see how that guy turned out? And <laughs> What's really funny is that <laughs> um, my parents are still friends with his parents. <laughs> so he actually doesn't live very far from me. I haven't seen him in many years, but um, he doesn't live very far from me. <laughs> Now it's kind of funny. We've ended up in the same area of sort of lower Hudson Valley of New York. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I kind of keep tabs on him through my parents. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. <laughs> but you're right. There is so much going on. And I, you know, I remember when, uh, it, you know, when I was trying to figure out how to make a living as an educational magician 30 years ago, I was running an after school program and, uh, I was amazed at the drama 
that the fourth and fifth and sixth grade girls went through. And in a two hours time span, uh, you know, uh, the girls could go from being on top of the world to having all of their feelings absolutely crushed and feel like they'll, they'll never be able to, to, to move again. And, and then uh, 15 minutes later, the world's okay again. <laughs> yeah, it is. I feel like it's a, a very dramatic time. And I think a lot of it is because you're going through things for the very first time. You know, you're going through like that friendship, friendships breaking up, um, you know, a first crush, things like that. It feels like so big because it's the first time, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it is the first time and you, Throughout our, you know, till that point, uh, you know, a lot of the first time things that we did, because when you're 10, 12, 15 years old, you, there's a lot of things you're doing for the first time. Um, but you ha- kind of have folks guiding you through those times. You know, the first time you, you're you on the uneven parallel bars and you're doing a vault or you're throwing a baseball or swimming or dancing. You have uh, adults, trusted people, teachers, really knowledgeable people helping you through those things um not so much with our relationships you know a lot of those things we have to kind of navigate by ourselves when we're that age yeah that's very true it's true um and it is interesting because i do feel like adults are an important part of your life still at that age um and when i read books for middle graders i like books that do talk about relationships with teachers and, you know, um, coaches and parents, but yeah, there isn't, there isn't always someone to guide you through those awkward moments and those, you know, the friendships and that that's harder that there isn't always someone to coach you through that. It's true. Yeah. And I think it's hard because I, I know for me, you know, going back to that time when I'm in that after school program, it was difficult for me because I couldn't wrap my head around why one or two words would crush you Mm -hmm. so badly. You know, so-and-so doesn't want to talk to me. So what? They're not that nice of a person anyways. There's 30 (laughs) kids here. Go find someone else to talk to. Uh, And so I couldn't relate to that. Uh, You know, I try as I may. I think I'm better now that that I was able to raise a daughter and kind of, you know, live through some of that on a, on a, on a, hopefully a better basis and, and helped her through it on a better, in a better way. But I think, for a lot of adults, we forget how traumatic it can be when I like her, but he likes her. He, you know, he likes him or she likes him. Exactly. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, that's true. Tell me, I, 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 someone suggested that I ask this of another guest. And we, we got a very interesting answer. A lot of a lot of folks talk about the fact that there aren't enough female lead characters in in books and children's literature. Uh, you've certainly written a strong one. How do you think female characters have changed in children's literature over the years? Oh wow, that's such a difficult. <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, you know, I just I do think that there's more, and I think that that's important. Um, you know, as a kid, I read a lot of books or was assigned a lot of books that had male leads or, you know, the lead character or the main character was, was male. And I always had to sort of, you know, follow that male gaze, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Um, but as when I had the choice of what to read, I often gravitated towards books about girls and, um, like the babysitters club was the books, you know, the books that I was really obsessed with and loved. Um, and those girls were dealing with a lot of the things that I like to deal with in books about belonging and friendships and things like that. Um, and I'm still finding those books now. So I don't know that a lot has specifically changed in terms of, um, of, you know, kind of what girls are dealing with. There just might be more openness now to more stories about girls. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm just seeing a lot more stories that feature girls of all different, you know, shapes and sizes and, and personalities. And there's just more of it. And I think that's so important that we don't always see, 
you know, one way of seeing a girl, we see, you know, 50 ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see girls who are, you know, navigating different things in their lives. Um, so I guess I just see more, more, uh, female main characters now. Yeah, we talk, I, I asked you how you saw that, you know, characters, female characters changing over the years. How has exploring the mind and living with this character changed you? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, you know, a lot of what Summer grapples with in this story and trying to understand who she is and where she comes from, a lot of that um, gets tied up in this idea of history and the past. Because kind of what I was trying to do with this story um, was say that, um, you know, that the world around us, around us kind of holds onto a history mm-hmm. and holds onto a past. Um, so when she swallows the ocean, she's actually able to um, learn something about her past and she starts having these dreams. So for me, it started, it really made me think a lot about how we are connected to the world around us and how we're connected to nature specifically and how there's like a wider world and a wider, you know, sense of being around us um, and how it can hold on to things that happened a long time ago and how we can sort of unearth and uncover them. Um, so for me, I think it made me look deeper at the world around me and think more about how I'm connected to my environment um, and how that connects me to the people in my life too. That's fascinating. I, 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 I love that. I love that, uh, you know, figuring out how you are connected to the environment and how that connects you to the people in your lives. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I loved exploring that in this book. Um, and I hope readers will think what after they do read the book, they will think about how they're connected to their own environment and how, um, you know, what they see is something that someone might have seen 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 200 years ago, and how that connects them to that place and and a, and a history. So. Yeah, you know, that's it's it, I think it's kind of natural when you're in a, a, a historical place imagining, gee, there are people here. 200 years ago, 300 years ago, what was that like? But, uh, you know, there, there were people in Westchester County two or 300 years ago, and there were people in Boston two or 300 years ago, and they walked the same streets, and what were they doing, and what were they thinking? Yeah, exactly. And Summer in this story really sort of gets a, a glimpse of the place where she lives. Like I said, she starts begins having these dreams about another girl, and that girl lived um, – I think it's around 15 years earlier than her. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she sort of starts to see the place through the eyes of someone else. And then she learns who that person is by the end of the story. Um, so I, I don't know. It, it made me think a, a lot about that, about, you know, how other people see the same place that I live and, and things like that. So I hope it, it, it um, allows kids to think about that. <laughs> One of the things that we talk about here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast, surprisingly, is how important it is for parents and caregivers to read with their kids and not just with their babies. But I, th- I think it's really uh, uh, critical that, that adults keep reading or co-read with their kids. What, what kind of conversations do you think families can have if, while they're co-reading A Swirl of Ocean? Uh, it's a great question. I hope families will read it together because it really is a book about family. Like I said, um, you know, Summer was adopted by this woman named Lindy, and they have a little bit of a, a different family um, because Lindy was quite young when she found Summer. They're almost like sisters, and now they have, and now um, Lindy's dating someone new and is kind of coming into their lives, and their family and their family is changing yet again. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great book to, to talk about the idea of family and chosen family um, and just the different kinds of families that are out there. Um, and then, like I said, I, I also think it's a great way to talk about, um, you know, the, the sort of history, um, history in our in our spaces and in our environments and um, kind of 
what's around us and how we're connected to it as well. So I hope that I hope that parents will read it with their kids and talk about it. Um, I think it's right for discussion. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and that topic of family and, and, and talking about what that is. And I think it can go a long way to reinsure kids that they're family forever. You, you know, they're that, that whole idea of, of, you know, gee, uh, it's, it's just not adopted kids or foster kids who feel like, oh, you know, maybe they'll get tired of me and send me back or send me someplace else. Um, so I think having a conversation about family and what that means and, and the commitment to each other can, can be really comforting for kids. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to put it. And, and really powerful to also know, um, that, you know, your family has your back and your family might not be, the person that, you know, you were, uh, you know, biologically connected to, Mm -hmm. um, a family could be friends. It could be, it could be someone else. So I think, I think that's also really powerful for kids to know that they, they can sort of find family in a lot of different places. So glad you're able to talk to us about a swirl of ocean. Are you able to talk to us about what projects you're uh, working on for the future? Um, so I am in the middle of writing a new book. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure what will happen with it, but it's a book that sort of spans three generations of girls. So I'm always, um, writing about young girls and, and their experiences and how they move through the world. And I've been really excited to tackle something that, um, you know, takes place over three generations. So I'm, looking at the 1960s, the 1990s, and today. Um, so I'm not sure what will happen with the book. I'm kind of in the early stages of it, but that's what, what I'm doing now and what I'm working on. I can't tell you how depressing it is when people talk about the 1960s like it's ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is not ancient history. <laughs> I know, but they make it sound like I go to Halloween costume parties and people are dressed up the way I went to high school. But anyway, <laughs> I guess that's what happens. Tell everybody where we can find Melissa Sarno online and, and find out more about the great books that you're creating. Oh, sure. Um, so you can find me on my website, which is melissasarno.com. Um, and then I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Melissa Sarno. Um, so I'm lucky that there aren't a, a lot of Melissa Sarnos out there. I've been able to get the website and the Twitter and Instagram names. So that's where you can find me. So you didn't have to do Melissa Sarno 473. And that, that's, <laughs> exactly. that's great. <laughs> well, we've had a great time speaking to the author of A Swirl of Ocean, a great new middle grade book from our guest, Melissa Sarno. Melissa, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, Dad. This was really great. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We have a wonderful guest. Her name is Susan Marie. She'll be telling us about Miss Olive Finds Her Forever Home. That's the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We want to thank the folks who made today's show so very wonderful. Of course, we want to thank Melissa Sarno. Please be sure to check out A Swirl of Ocean. I want to thank my amazing producer, Fatima Khan. Be sure to check out her blog. You can find it at readingwithyourkids.com. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all of the support she gives me. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for connecting with us on social media. Thank you so much for subscribing to the show. And thank you so much for making the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. What? <laughs>